Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for our webinar today with the Center for Disability Inclusive Community Development on Learn, Invest, Celebrate. My name is Michael Rush, and I'm with the Center for Disability Inclusive Community Development here at the National Disability Institute. Before we get started with today's webinar, we do want to share some housekeeping tips. Listening to the webinar. The audio for today's meeting can be accessed, accessed using computer audio or by calling in by phone. If you select computer audio, please make sure your speakers are turned on or your headphones are plugged in. If you do not have sound capabilities on your computer or prefer to listen by phone, you can dial 1-929-205-6600. The meeting code is 239-540-700. Captioning. Real-time captioning is provided during this webinar. The captions can be found by clicking on the CC button in your Zoom controls at the bottom of your screen. If you do not see the captions after clicking the button, please alert the host via the chat box. You may also view captions in your browser at www.streamtext.net forward slash player question mark event equal sign NDI. Submitting questions. Please use the Q&A box to submit any questions you have during the webinar and we will direct them accordingly. If your question is not answered during the webinar or you are listening by phone and not logged in, you may email a colleague Katie Achenbach at K-A-U-C-H-E-N-B-A-C-H -E at ndi-inc.org. Next slide, please. Technical assistance. If you experience any technical difficulties during the webinar, please use the chat box to send a message to the NDI host or email Katie Achenbach, again, at K-A-U-C-H-E-N-B-A-C-H at ndi-inc.org. Please note this webinar is being recorded and the materials will be placed on the National Disability Institute's website at www.nationaldisabilityinstitute.org forward slash resources forward slash webinars. Next slide. Great. So for our uh, today's webinar, we're going to share with you some information on the Center for Disability Inclusive Community Development. We're also going to share with you some of the activities that we have planned for 2020. We also will have a panel discussion on the notice of proposed rulemaking on the CRA and what are the implications for persons with disabilities and other low to moderate income community stakeholders. We also will have time, as I mentioned, at the end for questions and answers. So with that, to share with you a little bit of information on the Center for Disability Inclusive Community Development. The goal of the center is to improve the financial well-being of low and moderate income persons with disabilities and their families. Our goal is to raise a broad awareness within the disability community about the opportunities for capacity building available through investment, lending, and services offered by banking financial institutions as part of their community reinvestment responsibilities and also to foster greater connectivity between the financial service sector and the disability consumer and service provider communities well suited to collaborate on inclusive community development activities. The uh, center uh, is, uh, has five principal um, audiences that will actually be actively involved and served by the Center for Disability Inclusive Community Development. Low to moderate uh, income individuals with disabilities, also financial institutions, 
community-based organizations uh, serving low to moderate persons with disabilities and their families, community-based organizations serving low to moderate income populations generally, as well as federal regulators of financial institutions. Each of these are key audiences um, to be served by the Center for Disability Inclusive Community Development. So with that, and that brief overview of what the center is, um, what we want to do is we want to share with you um, some of the key activities that will be coming up in 2020. Um, and to get us started, uh, next slide, please. I would like to introduce um, the Center for Disability Inclusive Community Development Work Group co-chairs. Um, we have Janice Hamer, who's the principal with Hamer Consulting, as well as the former senior regional community development manager at the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta. We also have Tom Stokes, who's a former regional manager of community affairs at the Atlanta region um, with the Division of Depositor and Consumer Protection at Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Tom to share some information on some of our activities for 2020. Tom? Thank you, Michael. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Stokes. Uh, I'm going to briefly touch on a couple of things. Uh, one, um, uh, activities around our podcast. Next slide, please. And uh, uh, I'll follow that with uh, our in-person uh, trainings that we plan on doing for 2020. Um, the Keys to Financial Inclusion podcast series is underway. Uh, we're in the midst of doing uh, what we hope to have a, a about a dozen uh, podcasts that will be rolling out in April. Um, I believe we're planning to do that uh, uh, on Mondays of, of uh, respective weeks. Uh, and these podcasts will be various diverse guests that are talking about inclusivity around community development, what it means to them and to their organizations. Uh, we will have some that are focused on LMI and disability, uh, and others who were just looking at LMI in general, which would encompass those with disabilities. Uh, so these keys to financial inclusion podcasts will be about 30 minutes in length. Uh, we have a range of um, those that we've already negotiated uh, to do the podcast uh, that are from academia, such as uh, Yale University, uh, who has research that they have done on mental health and uh, poverty. Um, the University of North Carolina. Um, we will also have um, presentations from the financial uh, institution regulators uh, from the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis, who has a focus around uh, financial uh, stability for families, looking at savings and assets and debt. Uh, we'll also uh, have a speaker from the Board of Governors themselves. Uh, the Federal Reserve has always a designated governor that addresses issues around CRA and community development. And uh, we'll have uh, someone from the, uh, the National Credit Union Administration to talk about what the credit union uh, sector does uh, with respect to their outreach. Uh, we'll hear from uh, Wells Fargo in terms of their community development outreach uh, and also from some practitioners uh, around financial services, uh, the Credit Builders Alliance and um, uh, NeighborWorks. And, um, oh, I neglected to mention my, my, my former employer, the FDIC, as uh, one of the regulators that we'll have talking. Uh, I also seem to recall that we're lining up the American Association uh, uh, for People with Disabilities also as one of the guests. And so we, we are in the midst of uh, doing the podcast and if there are any additional suggestions uh, on sp uh, spokespersons that we should reach out to to speak to these issues on the podcast, uh, it dawns upon me as I'm looking at the list that we don't have anybody that's focused on micro enterprise. And so perhaps suggestions in that area would be very helpful to us. Next slide. We'll be doing a series of in-person trainings. 
uh, that we want to increase the awareness around CRA, uh, a basic understanding and how it can be utilized to maximize partnerships between financial institutions and community-based organizations to serve uh, LMI uh, persons with uh, disabilities and their families. Um, so, so this is something that uh, we're looking for hosts to do, uh, to step forward to do that. And I'm going to ask Michael Rush to talk a, a brief moment about what we're looking for in terms of host and um, the projected length of the training. Michael? Great, thank you, Tom. Um, so with our in-person trainings, as Tom had mentioned, it's really um, uh, working to build the awareness around the CRA activities um, for both the financial institutions and community-based organizations. So as a host, um, helping to identify a location um, to be able to host the training um, as well as um, uh, I helping assisting to identify um, particular audiences um, to participate um, within uh, these different trainings. Um, and the training that's designed for community-based organizations around um, CRA activities um, not only provides an overview, but it also uh, assists them in developing an action plan um, uh, with a financial institution as well regarding CRA activities um, in the three different um, areas. Um, so those particular trainings are a full day training um, and then of course technical assistance is um, provided uh, afterwards. Um, so if you're interested in learning more about the in-person training, um, please feel free to reach out to me um, at uh, mroush at ndi-inc.org. Thank you very much, Michael. And now Thank I'm going you. to... Sure. Now I'm going to turn it over to my counterpart, Janet Hamer. Well, good afternoon, everyone. We appreciate you tuning in, and we are really excited. Um, in 2020, we're going to launch uh, the Inclusive Community Development Awards on behalf of um, the Center for Disability Inclusive Community Development. This will be the first year. Uh, the purpose of the awards will be to raise the visibility of partnerships and collaborations between um, financial institutions and community-based organizations that serve um, LMI persons with disabilities. Abilities. We think that there are um, a, a lot of best practices out there, uh, a lot of partnerships and collaborations, and we really want to highlight those in terms of um, investment, lending, and service to our, our communities. Uh, so if you are um, either a nonprofit that serves persons with disabilities in the LMI community or a financial institution and you're working with a nonprofit, we would like for you to start thinking about um, nominating yourself or nominating someone else you know, nominating your partnership with a financial institution or if it's, if it's um, a financial institution, nominating your best practice that, you've, that you have undertaken with uh, a nonprofit serving our uh, disabilities community. Uh, we're hoping that this, will be, uh, that this will be a signature event and um, uh, an opportunity to showcase the good work that's going on and also serve as an inspiration uh, for future partnerships between financial institutions and nonprofits that serve persons with disabilities. So you have some time to think about this. We will be announcing instructions this summer about how to submit a nomination. And if you are interested in more information or if you have questions, uh, please feel free to contact uh, Michael Rausch. Uh, but stay tuned because we will be uh, disseminating information on how to um, participate in this sometime early in the summer. Next slide, please. 
We also, in 2020, uh, have uh, some opportunities for partnership that we'd like to talk about. And this is based on, on feedback from our partners from um, our work group, our center's work group. So we've put together some examples of opportunities for partnership and collaboration. And we would like for all of you to be thinking about how you can participate in this. So some examples are um, supporting our podcast series. Tom talked about um, um, the exciting uh, subjects and guests that we're going to have in this podcast series, supporting the webinar series. Um, this is just one of, of several webinars we'll be doing this year, and, and some of you, hopefully, uh, were uh, able to tune in to the webinars last year, last year or uh, listen to them on our website. Uh, also, we want to begin the development of quick reference guides to provide um, assistance to both financial institutions and nonprofits to understand how they can collaborate and what's available. Um, we want to be able to develop a handbook that will be uh, for building financial inclusion for people with disabilities through community development, kind of a how-to. Uh, to uh, aid in um, understanding how to begin partnerships, how to begin collaborations between nonprofits and financial institutions. Uh, we also are interested in uh, inclusive community development and financial inclusion summits. So be thinking if you have a regional event, if you have a statewide event, or if you have a national event, um, please contact us because we would be, we would love to be part of that event and to explain how um, we can assist in furthering these kinds of partnerships and collaborations between financial institutions and nonprofits. We also um, have opportunities for financial institutions under the uh, CRA performance context um, opportunities uh, in terms of uh, assisting financial institutions with community profiles and assessment area profiles and characteristics. And for those of you on, on uh, the webinar that um, are with financial institutions, you know that performance context, developing performance context documents is not exactly the most fun thing to do. And we would be happy to assist you with this. We have an enormous amount of uh, research on the intersection of um, uh, low moderate income communities and persons and, and um, persons with disabilities. So that would be something if you're interested, please contact us. Uh, again, if you're interested in any of these opportunities for partnership and collaboration, please contact Michael Rausch. Um, and we hope that you will be thinking about other opportunities. If you have some ideas that we um, have, have not yet included in this, please let us know. Uh, we would appreciate that um, um, information and advice. Thank you. And I'll turn it back over to Michael. Great. Thank you so much, Janet. Um, and thank you to Tom for sharing that information. Um, we look forward to working with you all um, in the, the, the 2020. Um, now I'd like to turn it over to Michael Morris, who's the founder of the National Disability Institute. And he's going to share some information with us um, on the implications for people with disabilities and other low and moderate income community stakeholders. And then um, we'll lead us into our uh, panel discussion um, with our, our guest today, Frank Woodruff, um, who's with the National Alliance of Community Economic Development Associations. So Michael, um, we'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Michael, and, and thank you, Janet and Tom, for laying out for our audience the uh, robust set of activities uh, being planned for the remainder of 2020. Um, I want to switch our attention uh, to something that I think should be of importance to um, all fi regulated financial institutions, uh, to all people with disabilities and and nonprofit organizations and, and communities uh, across the country um, that are looking at ways of improving inclusive community development uh, that is inclusive of people with disabilities. What I want to share with you is uh, first some uh, perspective on the notice of proposed rulemaking on the Community Reinvestment Act, uh, which was published in the Federal Register 
uh, back on January 9th of this year. It was available late last year um, from uh, both the uh, FDIC and OCC, Office of Controller of the Currency. Um, we are currently in an open comment period, and I hope uh, my reflections with you uh, on the proposed rules and then the conversation that I will be having with Frank Woodruff uh, will uh, stimulate your interest and will, um, if you had not already thought about it, uh, will review carefully the notice of proposed rules uh, and think seriously about uh, adding your comments uh, to be submitted to the two regulatory agencies. Next slide, please. 30 years after the passage of the Americans with Disabilities Act, the ADA, people with disabilities are still invisible in this notice of proposed rulemaking. Um, when you think about context, who are people with disabilities in this country? We know from research that National Disability Institute uh, has been uh, conducting uh, over the past uh, five to 10 years. Um, some of that research has been done uh, with data uh, that has been provided uh, publicly by the FDIC. Other data sources we have used have been from the Census Bureau and other data uh, has come and are working collaboratively uh, with the FINRA Education and, and Research Foundation. What we know is that people with disabilities are more likely to be low or moderate income. More than 60% of uh, adults with disabilities are considered LMI. We also have learned that people with disabilities are more likely to live in low and moderate income neighborhoods. A key point in terms of what is um, the obligations and, and uh, requirements under CRA, the Community Reinvestment Act, where a bank must look at its physical footprint in neighborhoods and address the unmet needs of low and moderate income neighborhoods and low and moderate income populations. We also know that people with disabilities are less likely to be banked or have access to mainstream credit. Uh, in the research conducted by the FDIC over the past uh, more than six years, we have seen that almost 50% of working age adults with disabilities are currently unbanked or underbanked. Underbanked meaning that they may have a bank account, but they are going back and forth between use of that bank account and using other sources of uh, uh, other entities, um, uh, could be payday lenders, could be pawn shops to uh, gain access to credit or uh, partake in what would be considered traditional banking services. If we turn to the next slide, please. We want to direct your attention to four major issues that we have identified related to the Notice of Proposed Rulemaking. Now, these are not the only issues that one should be looking at, but we wanted to really focus in on issues that are quite specific to people with disabilities, low and moderate income people with disabilities. What the NPR offers for the first time is a listing of qualified activities uh, for which a regulated financial institution could get CRA credit. Unfortunately, in that list of proposed activities, whether it's for investment, lending, or service, there are no examples provided of what would be more specifically benefiting low and moderate income people with disabilities, whether that be through investment, lending, and or service activities. This omission offers regulated financial institutions no specific guidance, no specific direction on how to meet the needs of this significantly underserved population. Second, the qualifying CRA activities list has eliminated the possibility for banks 
to receive CRA credit for investment in economic and workforce development activities, including apprenticeships, internships, on-the-job skills training, and skills certifications that are vitally important to many low-moderate income populations, including those with disabilities. For years, many financial institutions have uh, invested in workforce development activities and economic development activities, um, and yet these seem to have been pushed aside or certainly dramatically, significantly diminished in their importance when a bank is to think about exactly how will they be meeting their CRA obligations. Number three. Next slide, please. The Notice of Proposed Rules does not require banks to disaggregate reporting data by gender, race, ethnicity, or disability. Why is this important? Well, today, some 40 years after the Community Reinvestment Act was passed by Congress, we deal in uh, so much more data being available than ever before. We know that all people at low and moderate income are not the same. There are certainly intersections of identity related to gender, related to race, as well as related to disability. But the lumping together and just giving a bank um, a credit for serving low and moderate income people without really pushing further to understand in the footprint of that bank, um, in those low moderate income neighborhoods, it's not enough to just serve people of color. It's not enough to just serve women who traditionally and historically have been more economically uh, uh, impoverished and, and uh, unstable than men. It's important to look also at people with disabilities. And there is no such guidance. There is no such new requirement. And it really is disappointing when you think about the kind of data that is available today or could be made available so that we don't just look at low moderate income as uh, people, as one homogeneous group. We look at it as, in terms of there are segments. And uh, when bank supervisors, the regulatory supervisors are, are visiting banks and, and evaluating performance, it's not just about LMI in general. We would expect in this day and age with the data available, the data that could be available, that there would be this more direct identification of what is being done under investment lending uh, and or service for people with disabilities uh, differentiated uh, by these other identifying factors. Number four. The Notice of Proposed Rulemaking discusses the applicability of seven other relevant laws that address discrimination. Um, discrimination in providing uh, credit, discrimination in making available um, other financial services. But surprisingly to us, it does not list and what should have been an eighth relevant law and that is the Americans with Disabilities Act. This oversight continues the lack of attention to the most economically vulnerable population in our country, and it ignores their financial and economic needs. Since the passage of the ADA, financial institutions have been found in multiple court cases to be in violation of the ADA for lack of website accessibility, which deny, when you deny access that way, denies individuals with disabilities equal opportunity uh, to take uh, full advantage of services offered by the financial institution. And there are other cases that have found discriminating practices regarding access to credit. So again, this fourth area is, uh, again, surprising to us but as part of an overall package where people with disabilities seem somehow, some 40 years later, some 30 years after the passage of the Americans with Disabilities Act, in terms of bank performance and bank performance evaluation, 
people with disabilities still have not risen to a to a identified group that should be studied in terms of what is going on in terms of investment lending and service. Vibrant communities are best supported when economic opportunities are all inclusive of LMI populations, including people with disabilities. Unless the challenges of LMI people with disabilities are intentionally addressed, people with disabilities will be unintentionally excluded from the financial system and be overlooked as an important target of community development activities. I want to, next slide please, I wanted to share with you some further thoughts, but um, to do that, I've asked um, for Frank Woodruff, the Executive Director of the National Alliance of Community Economic Development Associations to join us on this webinar today to talk with me and respond to questions and engage in a conversation about this notice of proposed rulemaking on the Community Reinvestment Act. What are the implications for low and moderate income community stakeholders? What are the implications for low and moderate income people with disabilities, a subset of uh, low and moderate income community stakeholders? So Frank, uh, first let me thank you for joining us uh, today. And um, I think what might be helpful is for you to tell our audience, not all of whom may be familiar with the National Alliance, of Community Economic Development Associations, or NACEDA. Can you tell us a little bit more about your mission and who are your members? Sure, sure, of course. Thank you, Michael. Um, I'm humbled to be on the webinar with you all today. I saw the list of upcoming podcast guests, and that's an impressive list you guys got coming up. Um, so thanks for having me. Um, and yeah, we, please, please, you can call us NACEDA. Um, you know, it's only a 60-minute webinar. It's a really long acronym. We'll keep things quick. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but uh, NACEDA's mission is to lead the community development field and its partners in shaping and influencing strategies that advance community prosperity. Um, and <clears throat> excuse me, the, our, our members are state and regional network organizations for community development corporations. And so uh, we have 40 of those network organizations in 25 states. They're most commonly statewide networks. Uh, sometimes they're regional networks. Uh, and those 40 network organizations touch 4,000 community-based development uh, organizations, or CDCs, Community Development Corporations, <clears throat> in um, uh, 4,000 of those organizations across uh, our footprint. And for NACEDA as an organization, we uh, that's th those those 4,000 CDCs. Those are are what we consider our primary constituency. And when it comes to matters of public policy, uh, that's through the that's the lens through which we view um, uh, positively or negatively uh, pieces of, of public policy. Um, and similarly, we've done that here with the Community Reinvestment, Reinvestment Act CRA, which we'll talk about. Um, uh, but the, yeah, that's that's who we are, and that's who our mission is. Wonderful. Um, in talking about NACEDA, I, 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 I hope you could explain for our audience, you have a wonderful tagline, and, and that tagline is building prosperous communities together. How does your organization work to accomplish this at a state and a community level? Sure. Um, so uh, our members at the state and regional level, you can think of them kind of like a um, an access point for anyone within the state or even nationally who has an interest in improving the outcomes in L um, for LMI people in places, low and moderate income people in places and communities of color. Um, they, uh, so our members at the association or network level um, uh, realize and, and acknowledge, as we all do, that these places have often been abandoned and neglected by the, by the private market and sometimes even by, by units of government, um, intentionally or unintentionally. And uh, our members realize that lifting up these places and the people who live there has to be a team effort, and so that's where the togetherness comes in. Has to, uh, it's gonna, it takes private sector commitment, uh, uh, public sector leadership, nonprofit nimbleness um, and mission orientation, um, and of course, it takes advocates to 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 push us all to where um, towards our all towards our shared shared values. 
um, including small businesses, anchor institutions. Like all these are elements of a healthy and wealthy community, and our members um, at the statewide and regional level try to be the access point for all of those who have interest in improving um, improving communities. Uh, and I say, t but t tactically speaking, what that means is that our members will pr will do will provide advocacy at the state and local level to state and local government. They will provide training on real estate development or other types of programming or development. Um, uh, for for nonprofit developers and and, and CDFIs, community development financial institutions, um, they do research, uh, communicate, uh, market the value of the community development sector. All these things that are kind of done by at the network level um, are the things that our members do. Well, uh, let's get even more specific now. Is again, I shared some comments uh, about the proposed uh, changes to the CRA regulations. Uh, CRA became law over 40 years ago to respond to a lack of access to credit for low and moderate income individuals in LMI neighborhoods, uh, and particularly to address the challenges of the practices of redlining. The proposal that's come forward is, is from the OCC and FDIC at this point. Um, I focused on, on four areas of, of great concern and challenge to low and moderate income people with disabilities. However, all of the proposed uh, regulations are, are, are not uh, negative, uh, are, are, you know, there are positive things as well. Can you select out some that uh, you feel may strengthen community economic development to benefit low and moderate income populations? Sure. Um, there are a couple, not many, um, and they might get a little technical, but, um, you know, the CEDA, as, as I said, we try to speak on behalf of community development corporations, CDCs, neighborhood-based organizations, but, um, you know, we work with banks regularly and uh, to, in order to accomplish, you know, what, what needs to get done in these communities, and um, we often hear from uh, banks that there are just compliance issues that just are unnecessary red tape to their to them getting uh, the work done that they need to get done. We hear that we hear that frequently. Um, there's good reason to believe that for the most part, I mean, they're they're genuine about that, and and we agree um, that there are compliance issues uh, for including timeliness. Um, and uh, objectivity that can be improved within CRA, and the regulation attempts to do that. Um, however, uh, you know, I, the compliance piece from the financial institution's point of view is only one piece of the CRA puzzle, um, and the orientation of the proposal is, is, all, is almost entirely oriented at solving that problem at the exclusion of others, which we'll get into in a little bit. But there are some issues from a bank's point of view that the, the, the regulation does do better. Um, this, I think it, w it was a surprise to me. I don't, and I, I presume maybe to at least some in the audience is that banks don't really know where their depositors live, um, and certain, or, or at least not well enough to be able to report that information um, accurately to a regulator. And um, this regulation uh, implies that uh, the the bank going forward, banks will need to know where their depositors live in order to create their assessment areas. In other in other words, where they'll be CRA responsible, the geography. Um, currently, it's not done through where their depositors live; it's where their banks uh, branches are located. Uh, and so, the the uh, as a matter of public policy, it would be a good idea, you know, if we found a way to know where the depositors live, or at least make sure the banks know where the depositors live. And so, in general, we think that's a good step. Um, the and and the last two areas uh, of I would say a positive would be uh, fall under the category. Um, at, at least they tried. Um, the right in the proposed rule uh, first is under assessment areas. Um, I think maybe as it may be clear to some people, currently CRA only applies around physical bank branches. The rule proposes making it around physical bank bank branches, but also where there are concentrations of internet deposits. Um, CRA has not been updated since the internet has been uh, invented, so it hasn't kept up, right? And so uh, within the CRA debate world, it's a, it's it's really um, there's a lot of debate about what we should do about assessment areas. Um, I f honestly, frankly, can't say that I like what the OCC and FDIC have proposed for how they deal with that, but again, at least they tried. Um, they do, the, the second part is uh, transparency and reporting. Um, you know, they're uh, among the talking points 
uh, and selling points that the OCC and FDIC have on this proposal is that there will be annual reports for activity in um, uh, what banks are doing and under what categories, and, and you referred to that a little bit in, in your presentation, Michael. Um, and I mean, I, I get, I, uh, that's fine. Um, I guess that's a good thing. Um, but overall, this the the um, the proposal will significantly decrease the amount of pressure placed on financial institutions to invest where they do business. It's, it'll, it will take away the incentive for them to invest in LMI period, which I'll get into maybe later. Um, and, uh, and so I guess the, the purpose of the report, it'll, I guess it will be transparent how much low and moderate income communities are, are being disinvested in. Um, so I, uh, but I, I guess we'll know. Um, I, so uh, at least, again, I guess, I guess at least they tried. <laughs> so that, those are a couple of good things, though, that I think the regulation tries to get at. Okay, well, then obviously the flip side question is, can you pinpoint a few areas that, that cause you and your members the greatest concern and, yeah. and share what is it about those, those provisions? Sure. Um, so uh, the, there are kind of, uh, there are three main concerns and then some other more technical ones, but the three big ones are, um, you know, the, since the very beginning, uh, well, since the advance notice of proposed rulemaking a year and a half ago in 2018, the OCC has been constantly asking the question, what should count for CRA credit? And you talked about a little bit this in your presentation, Michael. And among the advocates in D.C. even, there's a lot of oxygen being taken up by uh, a debate about what should or should not be on the list. And uh, you're absolutely right, workforce development is not on the list, historically has been uh, considered CRA eligible um, in most cases, um, certainly people with disabilities, uh, investments related to people with disabilities is not on the list. But uh, from Mesita's point of view, we think what goes on the list is fundamentally the wrong question. The question should be what does the community need and the bank should serve that need at least to the best of their ability. Um, and so to get into um, a debate about what should should or should not be on a list um, uh, it undercuts what what should be the primary question about what the community needs uh, and uh, and furthermore you know it's uh, the regulation is very unclear as to uh, you know if a community need is different from what the bank invested in but what the bank invested in is is on the list it, does that count and the regulation is far from clear on that and I'm not willing to bet my community's future uh, that uh, that that um, that the, the regulator and examiner will, will rule in my favor on that, and so clarifying that if in fact they do go down this route of having a list, which we don't think they should, but if they do, clarifying that um, would be cert would certainly be necessary, and uh, certainly from a bank's point of view, they would want to know. Um, and and also there's just something fundamentally wrong with you know a, couple, a bunch of bureaucrats in, in Washington D.C. you know defining what a community needs and not letting the community itself define what it needs, and so um, we, that's that's one thing that we find um, very problematic. Um, the second is that by you um, there's the way that a bank would be examined would would um, uh, their rating would be entirely determined by how much money they invested in these eligible activities. That's maybe an oversimplification, but that's basically what it is, how much money. Um, and <clears throat> the, by, 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 putting, by applying a metric of how much money on a bank's rating, you're incentivizing them to um, do the biggest deals uh, for the least amount of work. And you, so you're looking at multi-million dollar uh, real estate investment deals through a low-income housing tax credit or through a large infrastructure project as, or, as opposed to um, you know, uh, uh, um, coming up with small dollar uh, business development loans for someone with, with a person with disabilities who's trying to start a small business. There's no uh, maybe a $50,000 line of credit or a small business loan. Are you, as a banker, if any of your bankers are on the room, you know it in terms of you know processing a fifty thousand dollar small business loan versus processing underwriting a, a multi million dollar real estate loan like the amount of time is between those two is not really that much different, so are you going to spend your time at fifty thousand dollars a pop or at a couple million dollars a pop if your goal is a large amount of money and so um that incentivizing large large amount uh, large dollar transactions that aren't necessarily targeted at a community need. Um, is uh, is very problematic from our point of view. From our point of view, 
the 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 uh, dollar amount is kind of it's not as important. If if you can accomplish the same serving the same need by doing it with a fewer amount of dollars, but maybe more transactions at a smaller amount, that's that's all the well and good. You know, that's fine from our point of view. But they're not the the regulation does not even leave that open uh, as a possibility, uh, or does leave it open as a possibility. But the economic incentives are not there for it. So that's the second. Um, challenge we have for it, and the last is um, the that uh, one way to read the regulation is that it legalizes redlining again. Um, the regulation says that uh, a bank can get an outstanding or a satisfactory on a CRA exam by serving what the regulation calls a significant portion of its assessment areas, um, and it defines significant portion. I'm doing the air finger quotes there um, as something more than 50%. And so, I mean, I'm going to tell you, like, if I'm, a, uh, I'll give you three guesses as to which 50% are they're going to serve and which 50% they're going to choose to leave out. And I'll give you three guesses, and the first two don't count, as my mother used to say. They're going to leave out the communities that have historically been left out. And this could have been an oversight on the part of the regulators, or not, I don't know, or maybe it'll get fixed in the end, or maybe it won't. But the fact that it got this far in the rulemaking process, um, it re it breaks my heart, and it and it should break all of our hearts because this is something that we thought we'd solved in the 1970s, allowing institutions and even government agencies to draw red lines around neighborhoods and say um, these two two people are either poor, too poor or too brown to lend to, and we're not going to. That that should be illegal, and and this um, this regulation undercuts that. So those are our big three um, big three uh, three big. Uh, uh, um, uh, problems with the regulation. Uh, I, you know, there's also language in there about uh, you know, currently CRA. You're supposed to, the bank is uh, an eligible investment is supposed to primarily serve a low and moderate income community. The regulation now adds the phrase or partial, so primary or partial to serve LMI. Um, you know, what does that even mean? And are we going to be investing in sports stadiums or, you know, uh, private hospitals in wealthy areas? I mean, these are things that you could presumably get partial credit for, but is that really the purpose of CRA? Does that really serve the legislative intent to end red, end red lining? End red lining? Um, so uh, this is another one. And finally, just, just a couple that the last one just really gets under my skin and I think is indicative of the whole process was that um, – uh, financial literacy uh, classes that banks now host for CRA credit and volunteer for currently have to be targeted at a low and moderate income person, right? By someone buying a house who's low or moderate income or in a lot of debt or, or needs some sort of uh, service. Now financial literacy to anyone, including Bill Gates, is CRA eligible under this proposal. Uh, and that's just ridiculous. Um, so that's, uh, that, that, I'll, I'll stop there. I could go on with some more, but those are our big concerns. Uh, appreciate appreciate your insights. Let me turn back to your organization. I'm going to combine questions five and six. Um, maybe you can share with us how your organization focuses on building uh, both healthy and prosperous communities. And you've you've placed particular emphasis on place-based strategies. Can can you explain a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. Um, for those who are less familiar with the community development space, historically there is this tension, and I would argue a healthy tension, between those of us who are the people-based, people uh, have the people-based strategies and the place-based strategies. In the end, the goal is to give people of low and moderate means uh, some sort of ladder to uh, improve their lives and for the lives of their families. And uh, the question, the tension comes in is how do we get there? There's uh, been research out there you may be familiar with, the, the Moving to Opportunity study, the Raj Chetty's research at Harvard University that looked at if you move a, a, a child um, from a poor neighborhood, uh, maybe simplifying a little bit, but from a poor neighborhood to a wealthy neighborhood, and you take another child and keep them in that poor neighborhood, over a period of decades, the one who had moved to the wealthy neighborhood, all else being the same, will have better outcomes. And so that's that the um, the people-based strategy um, yeah, kind of advocates and, and program implementers argue that well we, we need a lot of people-based strategies. From a practical point of view, we can't move all poor people to to wealthy neighborhoods. It's just it's it's not possible, nor and some would argue not not socially um, uh, desirable. So um, place-based strategies such as building housing, 
building economic, uh, performing economic development, safe streets programs, parks development, um, also have positive outcomes. And so, uh, so the question is, this tension often comes in, well, which should we pick? Should we pick the people-based strategies, safer housing vouchers or workforce training or support for entrepreneurs, or should we prioritize the place-based strategies? And that's a healthy tension. And I think, you know, a, a, a reasonable person could say the answer is both. We need both. Um, but we're all in the community development field, um, you know, we're, and, and, and among most sectors, we're pretty siloed and, and built around narrow interests. There's the housing folks, there's the CDCs, there's the CDFIs, there's the small business technical assistance providers, and, and there are reasons for, to specialize, uh, obviously. Um, <clears throat> but because, uh, um, but we've sp and we specialize because these the different areas of work have a lot of different benefits, um, including efficiency, quality of programs, policies. But we can't forget how interrelated all of our work is, which is the point. And which is I'm I was really really excited, Michael, when you when I learned about um, CDICD and the work you're trying to do here, because this is new, and I, and I think it's an acknowledgement of how interconnected we all are from Nasita's point of view. Um, in 2015, we set out to create what we, end, what we called the People in Places Collaboration, which is um, a collaboration of national membership and advocacy organizations that work together every other year to put on a conference, basically, on America's people and places. And um, we as organizations that are part of the collaboration, for the, a lot of us do our own conference every year on our own convenings that are oriented toward our institutional interests, and there's nothing wrong with that. NACEDA does it. We certainly do it. Um, but... Uh, but there's also there has to be this acknowledgement, as it feels, that uh, we have to turn our backs on our institutional interests and look at the bigger picture at least every once in a while, and uh, and acknowledge that we're all uh, we're all oriented toward the same north star. And so, um, in 2019, we had 17 national organizations as part of the coalition, and in 2021, in May, which is our next uh, one, we hope to add uh, at least one more in the Disability Institute. And hope you'll join us. But maybe that's a conversation for another time. Okay, thank you. Let me try to get us through, uh, we turn to the next slide, a few more questions. Um, how can we work together, and it's really a, a perfect lead-in from your, your last point, how can we work together to develop collaborations between your members and the disability community, whether it's housing or, or workforce, economic development, or, or other issues? Yeah, I would say, you know, the policy issue, certainly CRA is a start for us. Um, I think that's there's just a lot of uh, potential for overlap there. One, maybe uh, since we're running a little low on time, I'll just, you know, one narrower uh, body of work that NACEDA is undertaking is how the, the community development sector interacts with the health sector. More and more, there are hospitals starting to build housing and insurance companies starting to act like banks and that they're trying to find real estate deals for affordable housing. And, um, you know, the community development sector, I'm committed to, been working in it a long time, but we made a lot of mistakes over the decades, and we don't want the health sector making those same mistakes, and we're here, right? We, we know what we're doing. And so we're trying to figure out what that looks like, because the health sector, compared to community development, is humongous, <laughs> compared to the little tiny community development sector. And so we need to kick and scream to get noticed. Um, uh, and, and hopefully uh, issue, go into partnership with. And, and I feel as though that's something that dis interaction with the health sector is something the disability community has a lot more um, experience with uh, and expertise with that we could learn from. And so I, in terms of kind of a narrower body of work, I think that's something we could definitely help each other with. Okay. Let me combine the last two questions. And that is, um, you know, no one has a crystal ball, but it's, as you, we move forward over the next five years, what do you think are the major challenges facing states and local communities to promote equity and inclusion? And any thoughts on how we can overcome some of those identified challenges? Absolutely. So, um, you know, I, th I think the biggest challenge we're going to have in the next five years is just learning to trust our neighbors again. I think, you know, inequality, lack of public resources, um, these, those are all big problems too, but probably more than five-year problems. Um, different political stripes of people, we can't even find a way to talk to each other anymore. Um, and I, I think the ability to heal is there. Absolutely, we've done it before in this country. Um, but when we open the newspaper every day or open our Twitter feed or whatever, and we have the liter leader of the free world ripping open the scab that tried to develop overnight, uh, there's just no way to heal. Um, and uh, there are a bunch of bullies in Washington, uh, and there are too few people standing up to him. Um, and healing those healing those wounds over the next five years will be our biggest challenge. And and how we do that, um, 
is uh, the best way I can characterize that is by telling a story from my own personal life that gives me hope. Um, I grew up in central Wisconsin, um, uh, rural Wisconsin, uh, I, and uh, this is a story about Crystal, my cousin. We grew up together. Um, Crystal was born with cerebral palsy, and when she was born, the doctor said she was likely going to be in, the, in a wheelchair for the rest of her life. And despite that, Crystal and I were close going up. Um, there were always differences. I was pretty big for my age. Crystal was pretty small. I was walking when I was about one, um, and Crystal didn't walk until she was about three, but she did get out of the wheelchair. Um, and, but there was another difference between her and where that was maybe more important, and that's, that's a difference in courage. And I just remember this day, I was in <clears throat> the fifth grade, and we were getting out of gym class, and they were lining up all the kids against the wall, against the snow, snow pants and the, uh, the, the book bags. And I remember the gym teacher walking us back to our class, and I was, I was that day in the back of the line towards the back and I could see Crystal as our line went down the hallway and she um, she had a small stack of books in her hands and she was facing a circle of three boys who were obviously older and bigger than her and I could tell something wasn't quite right as we approached them um, and I you know I overheard their conversation and they were saying things that probably um, you know we, we can all imagine like hey Crystal you know why do you why do you talk so retarded why can't you catch a basketball and they were laughing at her and I could tell she was trying to get away, but um, they had her cornered. And I was the biggest fifth grader in a K through five elementary. I, I was quite big when I was young. I matured early. And I wish that I could say that I confronted those bullies, or that I told the teacher, or I did something, but I didn't. I walked by. I pretended I didn't see it. I was afraid. I was embarrassed. I told myself some stupid excuse like I can't get out of line. I, I have to get back to class. Someone else would take care of it. Um, you know, I didn't, I didn't have a, the courage to face a situation on that one day that she experienced over and over and over. Um, and I, you know, I, I think that's a story we can maybe all relate to um, because the people in places that we serve, you know, have their, back, have their backs against the wall and then they're, we're surrounded by bullies. Um, and they're saying things like, you know, the, these people can't support a, a grocery store. We have to build it in the wealthy part of town. We know these people need an affordable place to live, but they can't live here, not in my backyard, not in my district. They have to go somewhere else. Um, and no, no, we don't have enough money for services for these people because those people need to pay less in taxes. Um, and so here we are. You know, our communities are, back, are against the wall, and we're surrounded by bullies, and it's, it's, you know, it's really scary. Um, but you know, this is our moment in the hallway. Uh, it's the NDI's moment in the hallway. It's certainly in the CETA's. And we have to make a choice today that um, – that I didn't make all those years ago as a ten-year-old boy uh, to turn uh, turn to choose a uh, choose to turn a a moment of fear into an opportunity for courage, um, and uh, so we have to ask ourselves what are we gonna what are we gonna do about it? And I know that I'm going to use every re resource that I have to fight what's coming from the OCC and the FDIC right now. I'm I'm getting on your webinar right to enlist the people uh, help from people who know uh, who have been forgotten, um, and. Uh, because I know the people's stories in the CETA network and in your network match Crystal's story uh, that she may have had to work harder to achieve things like people for me like me take for granted, but she put herself through school, through college, she has a home, and today she's a nurse, um, and and she's done it with unmatched determination, courage, and hope. And so her um, her ability to work hard and achieve what she's achieved in life I know is inside of all of us, and that that gives me hope despite the bullies that surround us. Frank, thank you for sharing that story. If we go to the next slide, and we'll, we'll just remind people, the comment period on the, the proposed rules uh, for CRA uh, are due April 8th. Uh, we encourage you to submit comments, share your perspectives, share your insights. Uh, National Disability Institute has drafted a comment letter to base your comments on. Uh, we have the link here where you can find that. Uh, again, the letter includes instructions on how you can submit your own comments. Um, if we go to the next slide and go past that to just a, a thank you, Frank. Uh, thank you to uh, everyone who participated today, um, uh, to uh, Janet and Tom, to Michael. Um, Please, uh, we hope you'll uh, look uh, when the podcast series becomes available in April that uh, you'll share it with others uh, for insights in terms of keys to financial inclusion. 
Uh, we hope you'll uh, take Tom up on uh, the uh, invitation, uh, perhaps to plan an event with us, a training uh, in uh, your community, uh, anywhere across the country, and uh, seek out other ways uh, that we can work together so that community development is inclusive, inclusive of uh, low moderate income people with disabilities, and uh, that uh, uh, regulated financial institutions and our banker federal regulators all take to heart in this 30th anniversary year of the passage of the Americans with Disabilities Act, there is no better time to see the intersection between CRA and ADA and to bring everyone forward, leave no one behind uh, in terms of promoting equity, economic stability, and economic security. Um, so uh, let me turn it back to Janet and Michael and Tom. Any, any closing comments? I, I may have used up our time, but let me bring it back to you. Um, no. Thank you, Michael, and thanks everyone for participating uh, today. And um, the recording of the webinar will uh, be sent out to everyone. And if you have additional questions um, uh, that you would like for us to share that may not have gotten answered, um, please uh, send an email, and I will put the email address um, in the chat box. So thank you again to everyone for participating today. And I'd just like to add my thanks um, as uh, board chair of the National Disability Institute. Thank you for your support. Thank you for your continued involvement. And uh, please think about those Community Development Awards. We want to highlight your partnerships and collaboratives. Thank you all. Okay. Thank you. Take care.